Are you looking for a cocktail to toast the presidential inauguration with? Then you're in the right place. I'm Sarah, this is Historically Drinking, and this week we're talking presidential inauguration party history. Let's make a drink that was served at a blowout of a presidential inauguration party. We'll head over to the kitchen to make the orange punch, and then we'll come back here to talk about the history of that party and more. Come on. Welcome to the Historically Drinking Kitchen. Let's get started on this orange punch. So first we're gonna peel an orange. The whole peel is gonna go in here. Now I, I am making a fairly small quantity of this punch. I assume that nobody is making this for a very big gathering, so I, I sort of, I made it small, just kind of small enough to be for, for a couple of people. Um, but you can double, quadruple, octuple um, the recipe to make it as big as you want for huge gatherings in the future. I'm guessing that a lot of you, when you hear the words orange punch, what the taste buds in your mind imagine are something like, like orangina, something that's like, tastes like orange soda. And that is not at all what we're making. All right, there's our peel. To this, I'm gonna add some sugar. And then I have two ounces of water in here. I'm gonna boil this water and then I will add it to the mixture as well. There we go. Just gonna pour it right on top of everything. And I will stir it until the sugar is dissolved, which will just take a couple of minutes. Now to this mixture, I want to add some orange juice. So I'm actually gonna squeeze this entire orange into here. My uh, juicer might be a little, little small for the task, but we'll make it work. Uh, this recipe is modified. <laughs> Uh, um, this recipe is modified slightly from one found in J Jerry Thomas's Bartender Manual from 1862. I just, um, <clears throat> this, the recipe in there calls for Seville oranges, which are a little more tart than the oranges that we're really used to getting at the grocery store today. So the recipe in the guide just calls for orange juice. I'm adding the juice of half of a lemon just to make the recipe a little bit more tart because the orange that I'm using is so sweet. I also cut back on the sugar in the recipe a bit. All right, now I am going to let this mixture sit for 30 minutes. All right, so I'll see you in 30. Okay, it's been 30 minutes and our recipe is ready to strain. So I'm just going to pour it through here. I am gonna save my orange peel I want to have it ready to use as a garnish for this. So there it is. Okay, and I'm going to next add two ounces of Guinness. So the recipe calls for a porter. 
They didn't have a just a regular plain porter at the store that I went to. Guinness will work really well, though. Um, as far as stouts go, it's not super roasty, um, which will which will make it work well instead of a porter in this. So there's two ounces of the Guinness, <clears throat> and then I need four ounces of brandy. I'm using. Uh, Pierre Front 1840 Cognac. If you watch any amount of these videos, you know this is my go-to. I absolutely love this in all sorts of cocktails. So we're doing four ounces of this. And rum. It's a Jamaican rum. I'm using Ray and Nephew, which is a really, really high proof rum. Um, I got this specifically to use in this recipe, uh, but then after I put it in when I was testing it, I realized that I would have been better with something that was a little bit lower proof and something that had a little bit more um, barrel on it. So what I would really recommend for this is something like a Smith & Cross or the Hamilton, the 114 Overproof. Either one of those would be really, really great in here. That said, this one is fine. It's just, it has a little too many sharp edges, sharp alcohol edges um, for me for this. All right, I think it's ready. Okay, I'm going to scoop some into my glass, but first I'm gonna put some ice in there. A serving is about four ounces. Should be right about there. And then I just want to use some of this orange peel for garnish. There we are. Yes, perfect. All right, let's have a taste. Mm. It's delicious. Really turned out well. Mm. All right, let's take this back to the bar and talk about this crazy party and the history of inaugural parties. All right, come on. Welcome back to the bar. I'm gonna go ahead and put just a little bit of fresh ground nutmeg on top of this drink. If you have it, fresh nutmeg is a great addition to pretty much any punch. And very historically accurate. All right. Mmm. Ah, delicious. Well, so we all know this year, 2021, there will be no grand inaugural parties or balls. All that there will be are socially distanced media spectacles. Now there are two other times in the history of the United States that there have not been these parties surrounding the inauguration. The first time was in 1853 when President Franklin Pierce was mourning the death of his 11-year-old son. The boy, who was the last surviving of his three sons, had died in a train crash just two months before. The next time that celebrations were canceled was in 1913 for the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was a staunch Presbyterian, and he didn't believe in dancing. He thought that the celebrations were frivolous and not appropriate for the occasion. There was a time when somebody started celebrating too early. In 1865, Andrew Johnson, who was President Lincoln's vice president for his second term, he showed up to their inauguration still hammered from his partying the night before. His vice presidential inaugural address was apparently 
quite something to hear. He just railed on everybody. And then he was supposed to swear in all the new senators. He was too drunk. They removed him from this duty. Now, most years, there are official balls, there are unofficial balls, but during the Depression and World War II, instead of having these exactly, what they did was have privately hosted charity balls that were fundraisers. Most years, there's a luncheon. It happens just after the new president is sworn in and that this luncheon is really the grand affair. This is where the delicious food and drink is served. The first uh, inaugural ball was held in 1809, and it was thrown for President and Dolly Madison. George and Martha Washington did not have a ball hosted for them, but they did go to a dance party the night of his first inauguration. In 1829, Andrew Jackson carried on the tradition of hosting an open house in the White House. 20,000 of his best friends and supporters showed up to this party. This, my historical drinkers, is where our orange punch comes from. Orange punch was very popular during this era and had been around for quite a while. Punches with oranges in them in general were first mentioned in print in 1691, way more than 100 years before this one was served. His kitchen staff, Jackson's kitchen staff, who were most likely enslaved people, brought out barrels of this punch to this East Room to serve this crazy crowd. Madness ensued. People, in order to get to this punch, were climbing over furniture. Glasses were breaking. Barrels were being tipped over. The punch was moved to a garden. The president escaped out the back door of the White House. You know, doing the research for this episode reminded me of a couple of uh, interesting connections I have to presidents and inauguration parties. One is William Henry Harrison, who has the honor of being our president who served the shortest term. He came down sick shortly after his inaugural address and by a month later, he had died of pneumonia. I am related to him through his wife. My grandparents were invited to an inaugural ball, not a presidential inaugural ball, it was a gubernatorial inaugural ball, but still, they didn't go. I was crushed. Little girl Sarah was just imagining this fairy tale ball and they didn't take the chance to go. Oh well. Do you have any close connections to presidents or to inaugural parties or not so close connections? I would love to hear about them in the comments below. I have really exciting news. Historically Drinking is now on Patreon. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a service that helps you support the creators that you believe in, that you want to keep making new material, and that maybe you want to see a little bit more from. There are four levels of support uh, for Historically Drinking on Patreon. Each level gets you different bonus stuff. At the bare minimum level, which is $3 a month, three, you get access to, among other things, the notes that I make for each one of these videos. So if you would like to head on over to Patreon and go to Historically Drinking and sign up for one of those, I would really, really appreciate the love and support. 
Would you like to hear about the American Whiskey Rebellion? It seems like an important, like a, an obvious place to go from here. Hmm? Well, if you would, I'll attach that video so you can click on it to play next. Thank you for watching this episode of Historically Drinking. And cheers to the United States of America and the new president. Mm-hmm.